If you haven't heard about Anchor, it is the easiest way to make a podcast. Just ask me, the host of the Unexpected Tea Tour. And what I love so much about Anchor, it is absolutely free. Free. F-R-E-E. Anchor has tools that will allow you to record, edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And what's so awesome, when hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple, and many more. So if that's you, try Anchor today. Welcome to another episode of The Unexpected Detour, where in life detours are inevitable. I'm your host, Frances Hammond, and here we talk about the many detours of life. Good evening. This is Frances, back with another episode of The Unexpected Detour. Today, I would like to talk to you about my journey with the breast cancer and how it all began. If you've never heard it before, I just want to share it with you now because I can tell you a little bit more in detail of what I had to go through to get the surgery. So let's start from when I first found out in August. In August, I found out that I had breast cancer. I went to see a breast surgeon. I wasn't happy with her, so I decided to go to another hospital. Went to that hospital, and I had to get all the records from one hospital, send it to the other one, and then I met an awesome breast surgeon at the hospital, Memorial Sloan Kettering. Very nice. Very, very nice. Sat there. He spoke with me. I didn't go alone, which was good. So I had another set of ears to listen to exactly what he was saying. And that is important that you are able to bring another person along with you to hear what is being said. Because when you find out things like this, you're never going to absorb all that information because it's too much because it's shocking. Okay, so then... I'm scheduled to go for my surgery on September 7th, but the day before that, September the 6th, I had to go get a radioactive seeds implanted in me. I'm like, what is this? And I remember, I remember, I mean, I remember the whole thing just like it was yesterday. They put it in my arm and they put it in my breast. And I was told to stay away from animals and babies. Fine. Next day was the surgery. Surgery was good. But before, I I mean, I I remember I had a two-week appointment to see the surgeon. And I remember, and I asked the surgeon, I said, so what's the stage? And he was like, you'll discuss that with your medical oncologist and your radiologist. I was like, huh? So I was, I had a medical oncologist and a radiologist oncologist. What is going on? Okay, as he explained to me, the medical oncologist would give you your treatment. She's going to assign you what treatment she sees you need for what's going on. Now, all I know is that he told me that the lump was not big. It was smaller than a pea. It was small like the size of a pea. And under the arm, it was something under there, but never explained about being encapsulated. And I guess that wasn't his job because he's the surgeon. You know, the surgeon does his part. He removes it. He sends it to pathology. Pathology sends it to the next doctor where she is going to see what type of protocol is she going to have for her treatment. 
So I go see her. And it was actually November 16th. But I had already read the report because I could see the report in the portal. So I went in there and I was all smiles. I had my girlfriend with me, but she wasn't in there during this talk, you know, regarding my type of breast cancer. So I knew that it said stage two, but I had no idea it was stage two B. So what the difference is with the two? Stage two A means that your tumor is only in your breast. Stage two B meant the tumor was in the breast and underneath the arm in the lymph nodes. Okay, so that was something new. So I thought about my mother, when she was always tell me, when I get a medical license, then I can do my own diagnosis. Until then, stop trying to self-diagnose yourself. Okay, the lady was right. I shouldn't have done that. So I remember sitting there with her. And one thing I liked about those doctors, they draw pictures. They give you a visual of what's going on. And she did a visual, a visual of actually how my treatment was to go. So I was supposed to get, I believe it was like six weeks of chemo, which is not six consecutive weeks. They were every two weeks. Within the chemo weeks, I was receiving Herceptin, which was for the hormones. But after I received chemo, then I was to be scheduled for radiation. So, all right, so let's say chemo didn't start, stop until March. So it wasn't until April that I was going for the radiation. Even though I saw the radiologist, she drew me a picture too of everything. She explained it to me, but her concern was where the tumor was in my breast. So for you all that don't know, the tumor was on the left-hand side underneath the breast which lays right there where the heart is. And that was her concern. So just picture, it's your ribs, and right there under the ribs is your heart. So before she could do anything to make sure everything was okay, I had to go for an echocardiogram that, to make sure there was no problems, because as a child, I was diagnosed with a heart murmur. So the heart murmur was not seen in this echocardiogram. So I was able to proceed with the radiation. Now, let me tell you about that radiation. Oh, only good thing about it is I did get some tattoos. I don't like needles, but I have these permanent little tattoos where the radiation was. I felt good. I was like, oh, I got my first tattoo. However... This treatment for the radiation was something I could never fathom as I lay there on that table and I had to hold my breath. I had to hold my breath so the heart wouldn't move and so that the radiation would not damage the heart. So that is what I went through. That was 20 days. Not the weekend, just 20 weekdays. So it's four weeks I went for that. And I'll never forget one day when I went there and the machine broke. Well, the machine stopped working. And they had to call the tech in there. I mean, they had to call somebody in there to fix that machine. So I said, oh, my God, I got to hold my breath again. That was the worst thing, <coughs> excuse me, holding my breath. Because it's like you're holding your breath for one minute because that machine is taking the, the radiation, the radiation machine is going from your breast to under your arm. So you're laying there with your left arm up, well, both arms up because, you know, that's how it's done. But then to make it worse, I got burnt from the radiation. How about that? 
So the radiation is that powerful that it actually burnt my skin. It was peeling. It was raw. So that that's how bad the radiation was. You know, at first I didn't see it. And then one day I looked and I saw the burn marks and it hurt. So I was given some medicine for burn marks. But then I still had to go to radiation. And during that radiation, I had to have these echocardiograms done. And the echocardiograms would come back okay. Because I remember when I would go to the other hospital and that tech, she would always be like, you're going to be okay. Everything is okay. I mean, these tests were nerve wracking. So then after I finished that, it was Herceptin time. And Herceptin was done by itself. So that might have been about an hour. So every two weeks, I sat in there and I had that for an hour. So by the time I finished all of this treatment, it was 2018. And then I had to be put on hormone medicine which is letrosol, well, I call it esamecetane, which is letrosol, and another medicine for the next 10 years to control the hormones, to keep them from growing fast. Because apparently I have HER2 positive, which the hormones will grow faster. It's an aggressive cancer. So to slow it down, they give you hormones. Because I remember when the doctor asked me if I ever took hormones for hot flashes, but I never took anything, no hormone medicine. So she thought maybe that might've been a contributing factor, but it wasn't, I didn't have it in my family, nothing. I mean, I might've been overweight. I might've drank and I might've smoked, but still for 20 years of having a mammogram, I, it's, it's just, mind-boggling but it wasn't that mind-boggling when the breast surgeon explained to me about cancer when he told me there are cells that everybody has and if it breaks off and it's a bad one it attaches to a good one and that's when it begins to grow he, and as he put it it's like somebody who has a good um a bad a bad immune system and they can catch something and somebody that has a good one and they don't catch it so that was that story and then came along this other thing i have to get every six months and that's called zomata zomata is for the bones because they didn't want the cancer to mess with the bones because you also have to get bone density now, mind you, before you have a Zomata, you have to go to the dentist to make sure everything in your mouth is okay, because apparently it causes damage to your jaws, to the jaw bones. And I was like, oh, Lord, please, please, Lord, get me through this. So, yes, I did have a bout with the tooth from... I don't think it was the, from the Zomata, but I had to get a tooth pulled. And for me, I thought I was just going to have it surgically removed. Well, wasn't I surprised when I found out no surgical removal. This was actually pulling of the tooth. I was like, oh my gosh. First time I ever got a tooth pulled like that. Usually they are surgically removed because they are wrapped around the nerves in my mouth. So that was, that was a shocker, but I managed to get through that. So, you know, when you have breast, can, any kind of cancer, it really is, takes a toll on you, but the best way to go through it is to have a positive mindset. Through the whole time until today, when I go to the hospital, I just have to make light of it. I have to laugh, you know, I have to joke. I mean, from the medicine I take now, I have gone through menopause, 
but the medicine that I take as a nurse let me know, you might have those symptoms again. She was like, and it makes you, you're going to get moody and all of this. And I was like, Lord, I don't need to be moody. I'm already moody. And yes, I will attest to the fact that these hot flashes are worse than the first time around. And they are a real thing. I mean, my body will be on fire and the next minute it'll be cold. And it doesn't last long, like one minute, and then you'll be all cooled off. Your own personal summer. And then I had this chemo brain, which I didn't think I was going to get because I had finished chemotherapy and everything. But apparently, it's something that happens to people who get chemotherapy. It can go away, and sometimes it doesn't go away. But because I take the hormone medicines, that doesn't help either. So the chemo brain, I'll explain it to you. It's like you remember things, but you just can't get it off of the top of your head. And you just have to think. And, you know, I have a problem with people and they're saying, well, you just said that. Or I heard you say that before. Okay, forgive me if I did. I'm, I'm, I'm getting my thoughts together. I'm, I'm gathering them together. And if I said it before, hey, I'm 65. I can say it as many times as I want to. That's me. If I choose to say it 10 times, I'm going to say it. But, you know, you got to understand that, you know, the chemo brain is a real thing. So when I tell people that, you know, I'm not forgetful at all. It's just that chemotherapy and these hormones. So I pray that when I'm finished with all of this, that everything will go away. Oh, then there was another thing I discovered because I was told not to read any side effects of any medicine. Okay? None. I promised my nurse that and I promised my friend who's a nurse because she knows that I read stuff and I didn't read it. I got this thing called neuropathy. So I was laying in the bed and the foot got numb and the hand got numb. And I'm like, oh, shoot, what is this? Yes, that was another thing from the chemo. Okay. But that is gone. Oh, sorry about that. That is gone, thank God. So neuropathy, no more. But anyway, I just wanted to share something about my journey to be transparent about what I went through and hope this will help you or whoever you know that's listening that might be going through something to like just just keep the faith really keep the faith don't let anybody bring negativity to you don't let them talk negative to you don't let them tell you horror stories about what people before you went through and just so you'll know, because I see a lot of people saying they're cancer free and I have to be real and transparent with you, it goes into remission. And your doctors will never tell you that it's curable. They will say it's treatable. So you gotta pay attention and know the difference with the words. Curable means it could be, it's done. Treatable is treatable. It's not, you're not free, you're in remission. So that is a fact. And that is what made me be able to deal with the cancer. It was hard to know that it's not curable. It was comforting to know that it was treatable, but it was not comforting to know that it goes into remission because it can always come back. But I pray that whoever is going through cancer, any kind of cancer, if you're in remission, that it never comes back. And with that, good night. Have a good day. If you have enjoyed any of my episodes on The Unexpected Detour, Please remember to share and like 
with a friend. Sharon is Karen. And you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram, Unexpected Detour with a Heart. If you would like to be a guest on here and tell us of your unexpected detours, you can contact me at the unexpected detour 17 at gmail. I look forward to hearing from you so we can talk about your unexpected detours.